There's a short story published in 1893 by the writer Charlotte Riddell. It involves a brother and sister who are staying in an English country mansion that's not only dreary and desolate, but also, quite possibly, they're told, haunted. They weren't sure what to make of the ghost stories, but they were even less sure what to make of the strange and eerie sounds they started hearing in the house. So at night, the brother would stay up into the wee hours, his trusty pistol close at hand, just in case. Until one night, the sister called up to her brother from downstairs, saying, they're in the oak parlor. They were a pair of ghosts. And when the brother came downstairs to meet his sister, he saw what she saw. The ghosts were sitting at a table in deep concentration over a game of cards. The siblings watched, dumbfounded, as the game unfolded and then escalated into a tense and violent scene between the ghosts, the end of which left the siblings with a mystery, which is resolved in the story's surprise ending. But maybe the most surprising thing about the story, at least to a modern audience, is that this is a Christmas story. It's called A Strange Christmas Game. And if you're like most people, you've probably never heard of it. But don't worry, I'm going to read it to you at the end of this episode. But first, we've got some work to do. Nowadays, our Christmases are mainly warm and cozy. They're about reunions and homecomings, romances and magical journeys and visits from St. Nicholas. But not so very long ago, and especially for the Victorians, Christmas stories could send chills down your spine and make you think twice about things that go bump in the night. So what do ghosts have to do with Christmas? And if Christmas ghost stories used to be so popular, what happened? Where'd they go? And is there any chance that they could come back? Back, as it were, from the dead? I'm Brian Earle. This is Christmas Past. Everyone knows the song, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year, especially the iconic version sung by Andy Williams. It contains the lines, there'll be parties for hosting, marshmallows for toasting, and caroling out in the snow. There'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmases long, long ago. Scary ghost stories? Most people could probably name only one Christmas ghost story, Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol. But... Is that even scary? In the Victorian period, they would have thought some of these ghosts were pretty spooky, especially because you can imagine they're in the dark by candlelight hearing these stories, and then they have to go down a darkened hall or just find their bed in the dark. So to them, I think the scare level was higher. That's Tara Moore. She's a professor of English at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania. She's also the author and editor of several books, including the Valancourt Book of Victorian Christmas Ghost Stories. And as she tells it, the Christmas ghost story was really just an extension of the fact that people were used to telling ghost stories in general. It's an oral tradition. We know that they were, were doing this back in the 1600s and 1700s and possibly earlier. Now, back in the 17th century, belief in the supernatural was much more common. Life expectancies were shorter for a variety of reasons. Departed spirits and the unknown and the unexplainable were just a bigger part of everyday life for most people, especially during the winter. One of the reasons that this might be is because of the winter solstice. Even in the Victorian period, the summer solstice and the winter solstice still had some meaning. So it was kind of seen as a time when ghosts might be a little bit able to enter the human realm. And so it was also a, a great time to be telling stories. The harvest was done. The sun was going down really early, so people were gathered around the fire. And they developed this tradition of people sharing what they had seen that was uncanny in their community or just or telling beloved ghost stories. But fast forward to the 19th century, the Victorians were scientifically and technologically advanced. And yet the fascination with ghost stories persisted. Why? The spiritualist movement, which got its start in America in the mid-19th century before spreading to England, was based on the belief that the spirits of the dead were real and willing and able to communicate with the living. Seances and spirit mediums were very much in vogue. And even many prominent Victorian scientists became converts after studying the phenomenon. Maybe the most notable adherent was a physician by the name of Arthur Conan Doyle, who would go on to create one of the most memorable characters in all of literature, Sherlock Holmes. Also, certain technological advances of the time ironically helped to perpetuate ghosts in general culture. While ghosts have appeared in stage plays since ancient times, New innovations in stagecraft around this time made it possible to portray realistic apparitions in the theater. 
and the emerging medium of photography often produced ghostly images due to the phenomenon known as double exposure. But an even simpler form of technology was perhaps doing the most for ghosts and Christmas. With the popularity of Christmas ebbing and then also growing back up again in the Victorian period, it came back to life in print. The Christmas periodicals were a place that became known for having ghost stories. And because of the increased literacy and the cheaper prices for printing and, and paper, this all meant that there were a lot more periodicals to buy at Christmas. So it was a tradition to buy them. The print medium around this time played a huge role in defining our modern idea of Christmas. Imagine Christmas without a visit from St. Nicholas or the published drawings of Thomas Nast's Santa Claus. It was magazines that helped to popularize the Christmas tree. And of course, print brought us that most well-known and well-loved Christmas ghost story, Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol. He was someone who didn't believe in ghosts at all, so he mostly wanted to create not so much a ghost story, but a spirit story, some kind of otherworldly spirit, and training people to be different and to especially be more appreciative of their middle class lifestyle and be more generous. He did set this tone of let's harness these ghosts to be more like our new Victorian Christmas. And a side effect of the print medium that helped things spread far and wide was the simple fact that something that can be printed can also be plagiarized. Christmas Carol was plagiarized very early, so there were illegal theater versions going on. We had, because of the copyright law or lack of copyright law, it was carried over to America and was published widely here. And it did have a big impact on um, especially the, um, the middle class, and, and that seemed to strike a chord right at the right moment with people who were wealthy and were looking around them and recognizing that they had a responsibility. The Dickens' vision of a spooky yet relatively tame spirit was just one author's take on the subject. The Victorian period also produced some seriously creepy Christmas ghost stories. There were some scarier ones. So there were the moral ghosts, kind of like Dickens spirits. They're, they're imparting good morals, trying to teach people to evaluate their lives differently. And then there were some that were just out there because they'd been murdered or they had something important to share with a descendant. I also like one that's by Elizabeth Gaskell, who's known for her other novels. And she's writing in the early 1800s. She has a ghost that's a child. I always think those are kind of, kind of scary. And so it's a mother and her young child. They died out in the, uh, in the cold after they were sent away from the house. Those ghosts are trying to right a wrong, and they are pretty angry. And the, uh, the woman that they're haunting ends up dying at the end of the, the ghost story because she's come face to face with her sister's ghost. So in, in that case, they're trying to get retribution, and they're happy to bring about the death of their, their relative. But given how pervasive and popular the Christmas ghost story once was, why is A Christmas Carol the only one that's still popular today, especially in America? How and why did all of those others vanish back into the great beyond? The, the Puritans Blame of the North the had Puritans. some fights against Christmas. They wanted to censor Christmas. And so it slowly grew up by the late 1800s, but there was, in the early 1900s, but it was, it was, it wasn't as if we, had all, we have always celebrated it the same way, even in the last 200 years. So I think it might be the fact that it, we had gone a while without celebrating it, that we did recreate it, largely based around industrial consumerism, and then moved into mainstream culture. Now, the idea of a creepy Christmas hasn't died out altogether, of course. Christmas horror movies and slasher films are still able to find an audience. There have been movies about Krampus and evil snowmen, the 1974 slasher Black Christmas is getting a reboot this year. So is there any chance that we could one day return to the haunted heyday of Christmas ghost stories? To me, it seems unlikely that it's going to be a growth area for Christmas stories, especially in mainstream American culture. It would take quite a bit of digging for everyone to enjoy that history and see it brought forward. We might find these ideas so antagonistic toward each other, the idea of Christmas and horror, and we really like those homecoming stories. So I think also it doesn't feel natural. Well, whether you prefer your Christmases spooky or cozy, there's no denying that many of the traditions we practice here in America came to us from England. But not all English traditions made it to America, like the one about leaving children's gifts for them at the foot of their bed, as Stephanie recounts in this Christmas memory. My grandmother is from England, and the tradition there is that Father Christmas leaves gifts at the end of the children's beds. And that is what was done with my father as he was growing up as well. My mother, though, wasn't too keen on not being able to see my sister and I opening our stockings on Christmas morning, so she and Santa made a compromise that 
One gift was able to be left at the end of our bed and the rest would be in the stockings or underneath the tree for us to enjoy opening as a family together. And that's been a really nice tradition that my sister and I have carried forward with our own children. And not only is it a a nod to our heritage, but it also gives mom and dad an extra few minutes in bed on Christmas morning as our children discover those toys at the end of the bed that Santa has left overnight and, and spend a little time playing with them. So that's my Christmas memory and I hope you've enjoyed hearing it. Merry Christmas, everyone. I'd love to hear your Christmas memories and share them with the rest of the Christmas Past family. It's easy to do. Just record a voice memo into your phone and send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. Now, want to hear a ghost story? Make sure the lights are on and the door is locked, because here's The Strange Christmas Game. It was the middle of November when we arrived at Martingdale, and found the place anything but romantic or pleasant. The walks were wet and sodden, the trees were leafless, there were no flowers save for a few late pink roses blooming in the garden. It had been a wet season, and the place looked miserable. Claire would not ask Alice down to keep her company in the winter months as she had intended, and for myself the Cronsons were still absent in New Norfolk, where they meant to spend Christmas with old Mrs. Cronson, now recovered. Altogether, Martingdale seemed dreary enough, and the ghost stories we had laughed at while sunshine flooded the room became less unreal when we had nothing but blazing fires and wax candles to dispel the gloom. They became more real also when servant after servant left us to seek situations elsewhere, when noises grew frequent in the house, when we ourselves, Claire and I, with our own ears heard the tramp tramp the banging and the chattering that had been described to us. My dear reader, you doubtless are free from superstitious fancies. You poo-poo the existence of ghosts and only wish that you could find a haunted house in which to spend the night, which is all very brave and praiseworthy, but wait till you are left in a dreary, desolate, old country mansion filled with the most unaccountable sounds without a servant and none save an old caretaker and his wife who, living at the extremest end of the building, heard nothing of the tramp tramp bang bang going on in all hours of the night. At first, I imagine the noises were produced by some evil disposed person who wished for purposes of their own to keep the house uninhabited. But by degrees, Claire and I came to the conclusion that the visitation must be supernatural and Martingdale by consequence untentable. Still, being practical people unlike our predecessors, not having any money to live where and how we liked, we decided to watch and see whether we could trace any human influence in the matter. If not, it was agreed that we were to pull down the right wing of the house and the principal staircase. For nights and nights, we sat up till two or three o'clock in the morning. Claire engaged in needlework and I reading with a revolver lying on the table beside me. But nothing, neither sound nor appearance rewarded our vigil. This confirmed my first ideas that the sounds were not supernatural. But just to test the matter, I determined on Christmas Eve the anniversary of Mr. Jeremy Lester's disappearance, to keep watch myself in the red bedchamber. Even to Claire, I never mentioned my intention. About ten, tired out with our previous vigils, we each retired to rest, somewhat ostentatiously perhaps. I noisily shut the door to my room, and when I opened it half an hour afterwards, no mouse could have pursued its way along the corridor with greater silence and caution than myself. Quite in the dark, I sat in the red room. For over an hour, I might as well have been in my grave for anything I could see in the apartment. But at the end of that time, the moon rose and cast strange lights across the floor and upon the wall of the haunted chamber. Hitherto, I kept my watch opposite the window. Now, I changed my place to a corner near the door, where I was shaded from observation by the heavy hangings of the bed and an antique wardrobe. Still, I sat on, but still no sound broke the silence. I was weary with many nights watching, and tired of my solitary vigil, I dropped at last into a slumber, from which I awakened by hearing the door softly opened. John, my sister said almost in a whisper. John, are you here? 
Yes, Claire, I answered, but what are you doing up at this hour? Come downstairs, she replied. They're in the oak parlor. I did not need any explanation as to whom she meant, but crept downstairs after her, warned by an uplifted hand of the necessity for silence and caution. By the door, by the open door of the oak parlor, she paused, and we both looked in. There was the room that we left in darkness overnight, with a bright wood fire blazing on the hearth, candles on the chimney piece, and the small table pulled out from its accustomed corner, and two men seated beside it, playing at cribbage. We could see the face of the younger player. It was of a man about five and twenty, of a man who had seemed to live hard and wickedly, who had wasted his substance and his health, who had been, while in the flesh, Jeremy Lester. It would be difficult for me to say how I knew this, how in that moment I identified the features of the player with those of the man who had been missing for 41 years. 41 years to that very night. He was dressed in the costume of a bygone period. His hair was powdered, and round his wrists were ruffles of lace. He looked like one who, having returned from some great party, had sat down after his return home to play cards with an intimate friend. On his little finger there sparkled a ring, in the front of his shirt there gleamed a valuable diamond. There were diamond buckles on his shoes, and, according to the fashion of the time, he wore knee breeches and silk stockings, which showed off advantageously the shape of a remarkably good leg and ankle. He sat opposite the door, but never once lifted his eyes to it. His attention seemed concentrated on the cards. For a time, there was utter silence in the room, broken only by the momentous counting of the game. In the doorway, we stood, holding our breath, terrified, and yet fascinated by the scene that was being acted out before us. The ashes dropped on the hearth softly and like the snow. We could hear the rustle of the cards as they were dealt out and fell upon the table. We listened to the count, 15-2, 15-4, and so forth. But there was no other word spoken till at length the player, whose face we could not see, exclaimed, I win, the game is mine. Then his opponent took up the cards, sorted them over negligently in his hand, put them close together, and flung the whole pack in his guest's face, exclaiming, cheat, liar, take that. There was a bustle and confusion, a flinging over of chairs and fierce gesticulation, and such a noise of passionate voices mingling that we could not hear a sentence which was uttered. All at once, however, Jeremy Lester strode out of the room in so great a hurry that he almost touched us where we stood. Out of the room and tramp tramp up the staircase to the red room, whence he descended in a few minutes with a couple of rapiers under his arm. When he re-entered the room, he gave, as it seemed to us, the other man his choice of the weapons. Then he flung open the window, and after ceremoniously giving place for his opponent to pass out first, he walked forth into the night. Claire and I followed. We went through the garden and down a narrow winding walk to a smooth piece of turf, sheltered from the north by a plantation of young fir trees. It was a bright moonlit night by this time, and we could see distinctly Jeremy Lester measuring off the ground. When you say three, he said at last to the man whose back was still toward us. They had drawn lots for the ground, and the lot had fallen against Mr. Lester. He stood thus with the moonbeams falling upon him, and a handsomer fellow I could never desire to behold. One, began the other. Two, and before our kinsman had the slightest suspicion of his design, he was upon him, and his rapier threw Jeremy Lester's breast. At the sight of that cowardly treachery, Claire screamed aloud. In a moment, the combatants had disappeared. The moon had obscured behind a cloud, and we were standing in the shadow of the fir plantation, shivering with cold and terror. But we knew at last what had become of the late owner of Martingdale. That he had fallen, not in fair fight, but foully murdered by a false friend. When late on Christmas morning I awoke, it was to see a white world, to behold the ground and trees and shrubs all laden and covered with snow. There was snow everywhere, such snow as no person could remember having fallen for 41 years. 
It was on just such a Christmas as this that Mr. Jeremy disappeared, remarked the old sexton to my sister, who had insisted on dragging me through the snow to church. Whereupon Claire fainted away and was carried into the vestry, where I made a full confession to the vicar of all that we had beheld the previous night. At first that worthy individual rather inclined to treat the matter lightly. But when, a fortnight after, the snow melted away and the fir plantation came to be examined, he confessed that there might be some more things in heaven and earth than his limited philosophy had dreamed of. In a little clear space just within the plantation, Jeremy Lester's body was found. We knew it by the ring and the diamond buckles, and the sparkling breastpin, and Mr. Cronson, who in his capacity as magistrate came over to inspect these relics, was visibly perturbed at my narrative. Pray, Mr. Lester, did you in your dream see the face of… of the gentleman, your kinsman's opponent? No, I answered. He sat and stood with his back to us all the time. There is nothing, of course, to be done in the matter, observed Mr. Cronson. Nothing, I replied and there the affair would doubtless have terminated, but that a few days afterward, when we were dining at Cronson Park, Claire all of a sudden dropped the glass of water she was carrying to her lips and exclaimed, Look, John, there he is. She rose from her seat and with a face as white as the tablecloth, pointed to a portrait hanging on the wall. I saw him for an instant when he turned his head toward the door as Jeremy Lester left it, she explained. That is he. Of what followed after this identification, I have only the vaguest recollection. Servants rushed hither and thither. Mrs. Cronson dropped off her chair into hysterics. The young ladies gathered around their mama. Mr. Cronson, trembling like one in an og fit, attempted some kind of an explanation, while Claire kept praying to be taken away, only to be taken away. I took her away, not merely from Cronson Park, but also from Martingdale. Before we left the latter place, however, I had an interview with Mr. Cronson, who said the portrait Claire had identified was that of his wife's father, the last person who saw Jeremy Lester alive. He's an old man now, finished Mr. Cronson, a man over 80, who had confessed everything to me. You won't bring further sorrow and disgrace upon us by making this matter public. I promised that I would keep silence, but the story gradually oozed out and the Cronsons left the country. My sister never returned to Martingdale. She married and is living in London. Though I assure her there are no strange noises in my house, she will not visit Bedfordshire, where the little girl she wanted me so long ago to think of seriously is now my wife and the mother of my children. <laughs> Christmas Past is produced in sunny San Mateo, California by yours truly, Brian Earle. Thank you to Tara Moore and Stephanie, and as always, thank you for listening. Look for Christmas Past on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you're feeling the Christmas spirit, why not help more people find the show by telling a friend about it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts? Those reviews make the show more visible to people looking for Christmas podcasts, so leaving a review is like spreading Christmas cheer. I'll even send you a sticker to say thanks. Write me at christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com for details. And I'll see you again very soon. <laughs>